Rudens semestra otrajā noslēdzošajā mācību sesijā es uh, aicināšu mūsu vies, dr. Maikla Peina, tur, turmākajā pusminūtēs pārkliekšos uz Angļu, uz Angļu valodu Jānis patulkos, kam nepieciešams sameklējiet uh, tulkošanas ierīts, kas vispār visām lekcijām, ja, ja jūs vēlaties lietot latviešu valodu. Uh, welcome, dr. Peina. After uh, last year's class on apologetics, we were so glad you said yes about coming back and teaching ethics for Baltic Reform Theological Seminary. And we are thankful to International Theological Education Ministries in St. Louis for arranging this possibility. We are thankful to your church back in, in Virginia. We are thankful to your family for allowing you to come over for this whole week and so we are getting ready for an intense, intensive session for, for five nights and ready to jump in. Uh, and for th most of us know you, but for some who are new, could you please say some words about yourself? Uh, and then let's start with ethics. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I'm Michael, uh, Michael Payne, and uh, I came here from Virginia, uh, beautiful Virginia. It's called the state for lovers. <laughs> I didn't make it up. <clears throat> they did. Uh, and I think they must mean lovers of nature because uh, there's so much uh, beauty in Virginia and so many ways to enjoy the creation, the kayaking, hiking, mountain climbing, swimming, hunting, fishing, whatever. Uh, none of those I ever get to do <laughs> because I'm too busy doing other things. Uh, but anyway, I enjoy watching the cars drive by my house with the kayaks on top of the car and then seeing that people are having a good time worshiping the God of nature. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the big competition for the church in Virginia is the God of nature, which uh, temples have been erected all over the state for the very purpose of worshiping nature and not the God who created this world. So uh, anyway, uh, I come here after having spent a number of years both in America and overseas teaching uh, I spent uh, at least uh, 10 years teaching in America and about uh, 15 years teaching overseas. Uh, and so uh, I bring all of that with me, the good and as well as the bad. You have to accept both. And uh, anyway, it's a delight to be here. It's a delight to be able to teach a class for you again. And hopefully it will be uh, useful to the building up of the body of Christ here in uh, Latvia and beyond wherever God takes you in your service to Him, wherever that might be. So let us begin with a prayer. And let me open us in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the evening we have before us. We thank you for the Word of God, which is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you again that uh, we have been, not been left adrift in this world, but rather you have given us an anchor in your Son uh, by your Holy Spirit and through the Word that you have provided for us. Uh, thy Word is truth. And as we grasp it and as we apply it in our lives, we will find ourselves uh, living in such a way that you can say, blessed. And uh, that is what we desire, to be blessed by you for our uh, obedient living and our faithfulness before you in all things. So we ask that you would use your word to empower us, teach us what we need to know and understand to serve you better. And we would pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so the, the name of the class is uh, Biblical Ethics. And... Uh, so you'll notice in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, 
if I turn it on, which would be helpful. Uh, if you'll notice in the bottom right hand corner there's a little number and that number is the number of the slide which should match the numbers that some of you have in the little workbook that's been provided for you. So that will be an easy way to sort of find your way through the material once we uh, get started. The uh, slides overall uh, as Giannis will be glad to attest, uh, numbered over a thousand, <laughs> and uh, which is way too many, but nonetheless, uh, we prepare here for the future, not just the present, and so your opportunity in the future to uh, pursue this material further, uh, I think will be beneficial to you and to your ministry. Uh, and so the title of the course is Biblical Ethics. Uh, we could have called it Christian ethics, so it would have been just as useful, I guess. But, but in the end, what we want to do is make sure that we're uh, not thinking of Christian in the variety of ways it can be possibly understood uh, from a variety of denominational uh, perspectives, but rather uh, looking at it from a biblical perspective, which uh, would I think be better for us in the long run to recognize that our ethics is really rooted and grounded in the scriptures, in the Bible, and not in traditions that we may have uh, adopted throughout uh, time in our lives. So, <clears throat> not that there's anything wrong with traditions, but we want to make sure that they are uh, traditions that actually are rooted themselves in the Bible because that is the Word of God. Uh, so the title of the course is Biblical Ethics. And what we want to do is we want to start by thinking about the crisis in ethics, the crisis in ethics. Uh, it doesn't, uh, doesn't take a lot for me, I would think, to convince you that there is a crisis relative to the subject of morality or ethics or right versus wrong wrong, good versus bad, etc. Uh, <clears throat> but let me convince you or persuade you if you're not already persuaded by first of all looking at the symptoms of the crisis in ethics in the 21st century. Uh, what you discover is that you can hardly turn on a news channel if you have access to television uh, even locally, but if beyond locally in terms of uh, satellite and all the other things, or you can hardly go to a website which is a news-oriented website and not be confronted immediately with issues that are ethical in nature. I mean, if you simply talk about uh, the mass movements of people across borders, uh, and the response of various nation states to those movements, it's always ultimately uh, grounded in some ethical vision, some ethically appropriate response to that movement of people. And so even if they don't use the word ethical, they often use moral language to persuade one way or the other what the appropriate or right response should be to the mass movement of people around the world from conflict zones for economic reasons, for persecution reasons, whatever it might be. Uh, and so what you discover by simply watching the news or reading a newspaper is that everybody's talking about ethics one way or the other. They're talking about it. And it comes up under topics like uh, cloning, uh, same-sex attraction, the definition of marriage, uh, the transgender issue, uh, <clears throat> transsexualism, uh, <clears throat> sexual reassignment surgery, uh, it can be abortion, uh, it can be uh, selective reduction of uh, population. Uh, it, it can be how we invest resources in research associated with certain diseases or certain maladies that affect uh, people. Uh, to some degree or the other is the, the fact that something affects more people, make it more ethically appropriate or important 
rather than less people, which makes it less ethically appropriate or important. And so those are balancing questions that come up all the time. In, uh, in our exposure to the world around us. And so, but the deeper question we want to ask is, what is the uh, emphasis on ethics actually suggest to us? What does it suggest to us? And uh, Carl Krauss uh, uh, said the following relative to the emphasis on psychoanalysis. Krauss said, psychoanalysis is a symptom of the very disease of which it professes to be the cure. In other words, uh, all of the emphasis on ethics simply uh, doesn't solve anything for the most part. It simply tells us that there's a problem. So all the talk about morality really doesn't lead us very far. It just tells us that people are concerned about morality. Uh, and so the more therapeutic a culture becomes in its emphasis, the more emphasis on therapy you will find. And so the therapeutic, uh, the a classic book by Philip Reef called The Triumph of the Therapeutic, was a book basically by a social theorist which suggests that uh, whether Freud liked it or not, his legacy has been to create an entire culture in the West that is dominated by questions of the therapeutic, about how to make your life better or to fix your life in one way or the other. <clears throat> and and that thus tells us that the real issue is what is it we think is wrong and how are we attempting to fix it? And uh, of course, most people don't get around to fixing very much of it. So the question would be then, is that the same, is that true as well for ethics and morality? The fact that we're talking about it a lot really tells us that we don't really understand very much about it. We talk about it, but we don't really understand it. So we use the words of morality, the words of ethics, but we don't really understand what those words or those terms really mean, or at least we don't have a real consensus on what they mean. So uh, the symptoms of the ethical or moral crisis in our culture, we have to recognize, has historical roots. It has historical roots. <clears throat> And that is that all of these debates about things, one way or the other, uh, are representative of the history of moral thinking, the history of moral thinking. Uh, and so the current ethical philosophy is a reflection of our cultural condition. And the problem is that it lacks resources to correct itself. It lacks resources to correct itself. And the real question then would be, why is that true? Why is that true? Why is, why is the description of our experience one in which we're constantly talking about something, but we're never able to come to a point of conclusion about it? So we talk a lot, but we never actually conclude anything about what we're talking about. And the question, that is the question then, why is that true? Try talking to your colleague or a fellow student or someone who lives next door about morality and you'll find that it's mostly about talking and little about coming to resolutions about anything because it seems impossible for most people to come to a resolution. So the question is why is that the case? <clears throat> so then we look at the symptoms of this moral crisis. Uh, and what that reflects is that our views of morality, our views of ethics, are very fragile. Uh, that is, they're very weak. There isn't a lot of substance to it. There isn't a lot of depth to it. Uh, it's less associated with convictions we might have developed and more with opinions that we have partaken of by other people. So people have opinions, but they seem to have very few convictions about those things. And that is indicative of something very important, and that is that all of these things we talk about, if you will, are very fragile. They're very, they're like snowflakes. If you blow on a snowflake, it just disappears before your very eyes. And people's views of morality easily simply disappear once you apply any pressure to it. You ask any questions about it. And the, the question, of course, is what is that fragility rooted in? Why 
is it such a fragile subject? And is it inherent in the contemporary moral discussion or debate? And of course it is inherent and we're going to show how and why it is inherent. So we begin, we talk about this, with words we commonly use among ourselves and with our neighbors and our colleagues uh, that we probably have never spent very much time defining. Okay? We use words that we've probably never spent much time defining. Uh, and so that makes the communication oftentimes very sort of superficial. It's very superficial. Why? Because we've never taken the time or the effort to define the terms we're using, what those terms mean, where those terms come from, and what makes them compelling, that de definition compelling. So it's important to note then that simple notions like good or virtue, bad, evil, each of those kinds of terms have very distinct histories. Very distinct histories. In other words, they did not appear on the scene somehow magically, but they have evolved over time to mean certain things to certain people at certain moments in history. And we have to really understand and appreciate that if we're going to understand why we're, we're so confused about the subject of ethics. They have distinct histories and it illustrates how the ideas that go into these words have changed and shifted over a time. And that is reflected in the very changes in the cultures of which these people uh, participate. And so one likes to think that one's culture is some fixed entity that has been this way for a thousand years, but in actual fact, they all change over time. Each culture has a different history, a trajectory, if you will, in which the words that become commonly used, like good or bad, have changed over time. So the Christian finds it amazingly difficult to talk to someone about a, uh, something being good when the person has a view of good that's part of a history that has changed over time and the Christian is operating with an idea of good that is rooted in something eternal. God. So that makes the conversation somewhat difficult, somewhat difficult. And so we need to be able to understand that history, that change, if you will, if we're going to make sense of why there's so much confusion among people about things like ethics or morality, virtue, goodness, badness, evil. Uh, in effect, Thucydides, when he wrote the history of the Peloponnesian Wars, has a wonderful uh, comment and observation about what he saw during this period of history. He said this, the meaning of words no longer had the same relation to things, but was changed by them as they saw fit, and that is people. Reckless doing was held to be loyal courage, Prudent delay was the excuse of a coward. Moderation was the disguise of unmanly weakness. To know everything was to do nothing. Now Thucydides is making a very important observation that once words begin to change in terms of their meaning, you're using a word that no one understands to be what you think the word means. So they're looking at that word in a way that has been changed and transformed by various experiences. You're standing there using the word thinking it has a fixed meaning, an eternal meaning. And that means your conversation is this way. You're talking about things on two different levels, two different planes of meaning. And when that happens, you can imagine what confusion will ensue as a result. So if you take terms like moral, immoral, amoral, non-moral, moralistic, value, virtue, good, well thought of, baseborn, right, just, customer, convention, nature, 
And we might go, well, I can define all of those words. Really? Well, maybe you can, but maybe the person who's using the very same word has a totally different understanding of what it means. So you're trying to talk about immorality, and they're going, well, that's not what I think of when I think of immorality. And you're going, oh, well, we're never going to make a connection here about good and bad, moral, immoral, ethical, unethical, if we don't come to some understanding about these terms and where they come from and how they've changed. So if you take some of these terms, for example, like the term moral or ethical, Sometimes, and I think most often, we use those terms as synonyms. They're synonymous meanings. Moral and ethical basically mean the same thing, and that's how we'll use the term here. But they can be used in different ways. They can be used in different ways, at least two different ways. You can use them as descriptions, as a descriptive term. Uh, and that can be used, for example, when we're talking about the, the discipline of ethics itself. In other words, you could say something like, that is an ethical question, not an aesthetic question. That is an ethical question, not an aesthetic question. So it's being used descriptively. Or it can be used normatively, as a standard, if you will, conforming to ethical norms. Okay, So ethical there is different than simply describing something. It's actually giving us a normative perspective. You could say, uh, he is an ethical politician. And that means he is some kind of politician that you deem consistent with the standard, which is ethical, whatever that might be. You could take a term like immoral. Immoral meaning ethically bad or wrong. That would be the, if you will, converse of ethical. Uh, you can take amoral. What is an amoral person? They oftentimes present themselves as being above the moral person. An amoral person is a person that doesn't pass judgment on something being good or bad. Hence, they are not immoral, they are amoral. There is no moral standard by which you could define some behavior or activity or thought as bad. So that's a person with no moral standard. Or at least this is a person who presents themselves with no moral standards. They would be unwilling uh, to think about moral issues uh, in making life decisions. In other words, it would have no moral dimension to it one way or the other. And then there's a person who's simply uh, non-moral, namely they've determined that some things are moral and some things are simply not moral. Therefore, don't confuse those two things or else you get into trouble. Then you have the moralistic, the idea of the moralistic. And that is a, a, that is a term that's often applied to Christians as being moralistic. And uh, it's a, a kind of ambiguous term in terms of what it means. And as a result of its ambiguity, I would almost never use that expression, moralistic. Okay, moralistic. Uh, it simply expresses an attitude, generally a negative attitude. So as a Christian, you want to say something is immoral. They would say you're being moralistic. And they wouldn't mean that in a positive way. It would be in a very negative way, moralistic. You're preaching your morality, and that is considered a bad thing by uh, many uh, people. Uh, it would be seen as something provincial. You're only saying that because you come from a very traditional background. 
and your world is very small and so your view of morality doesn't connect with the big world out there so you're being moralistic it's a way of putting someone down or at least dismissing their views on what's good or what is bad it generally reflects a very self-righteous attitude okay I'm better than you are because I don't pass judgment on things being good or bad the way you do so then there's also a person who is legalistic legalistic and uh, that you find in churches uh, frequently uh, but you don't have to be a Christian to be a legalist but uh, but legalistic uh, is in effect putting law in a role reserved for grace putting law in a role reserved for grace uh, <clears throat> It's oftentimes looking at moral rules as a kind of sticks that you beat people up with. So a legalistic person is a person who's settled on a view of morality and then they turn around and use that view of morality and they beat people up with it. And that's, that's typical of a uh, uh, legalistic attitude that we often experience or we've seen. Uh, putting too much emphasis uh, on the law too much emphasis on the law without seeing the law as it's best understood in Scripture. Uh, it's, uh, it's preaching ethics without any sensitivity to the history of redemption, the history of salvation. So you isolate something in the Old Testament, let's say, and then you carry that over into the New Testament, and then you beat people up with it because it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. How could you not go with this? But not seeing that the change through time in terms of the history of redemption uh, has set, taken certain things within the context of their original presentation and refuses to see that God meant and intended that to change over time for larger redemptive purposes. So you see that, for example, you'll meet Christians, some I assume, not that many, but perhaps some, who will build their lives around the Old Testament dietary laws. So if we all only ate the things that were consistent with the Old Testament dietary laws, it, we would just be happy. <laughs> We'd be healthy and God would be so happy with us and we would just live a godly lifestyle. And, uh, and so they refused to see that the Old Testament di dietary laws were uh, instituted for a very specific purpose at a very specific moment in history and that over time, God himself adjusts the dietary laws according to the phase of redemptive history he's in. You remember Peter was caught up in the pharisaical notion of the dietary laws in which there was no context for the dietary laws among Pharisees. They were legalists, right? And here, Peter is not going to eat certain foods because the Pharisees say, look, it's in the Old Testament. We don't eat these kind of foods. And then what does God do? He says, well, let me just send a little vision to old Peter. And Peter's going to see this big sheet coming down out of heaven with all this food he's not supposed to eat. And you're, you're supposed to eat all of it. Why? Because Christ has come and fulfilled all the dietary laws, all the laws of cleanliness in the Old Testament and now therefore we are free to enjoy all of these foods that otherwise they were prohibited from eating. Why? To bring their attention to the details of sin and God's interest in all the details of sin that needed to be cleansed by Christ. So a failure to see the history of redemption relative to any Old Testament laws is a mistake. It's a view that leads people to very strange conclusions that again make it unhelpful uh, in terms of talking about morality or ethics as a Christian. Uh, so then you have people, <clears throat> for example, that say that uh, you should never uh, you should never use uh, a biblical character as a moral example. 
Now, this is, a, again, pretty common among some Christians, that uh, the, the, the extreme attitude is you should never use biblical characters as examples. That leads to moralistic thinking. And, of course, it can lead to moralistic thinking, but that's simply not consistent with the Bible itself, which often uses moral examples to teach certain points, certain lessons. Paul talked about the, the Old Testament and the experiences of the people of Israel in the wilderness in the Old Testament. He said God gave them as an example. Oh, so these are people God gave as an example. Maybe there are other people he gave as an example. Well, surely he did. And if you read a chapter like Hebrews 11, it's just it's full of examples using historical people from the Old Testament as an example of uh, either righteousness or something else. Uh, the, the danger is some people write books using biblical characters and what they fail to do, I'm not going to mention any names, but what they fail to do is to uh, remind people that whatever the example might be, say take David, I said, David is a wonderful example of certain things, isn't he? But he's not a good example of a lot of other things, is he? Can we get a yes to that? Uh, I mean, David's, David's uh, you know, skullduggery with Bathsheba is hardly an example we should follow. Uh, but then again, his confession, his contrition before God is an example we should follow. And so you have to look at each case in particular and be reminded that no matter who the example is, there's only one person in Scripture who was perfect and infallible, and that was Jesus Christ. So don't ever confuse David for Jesus or Abraham for Jesus or Daniel for Jesus, or any of these people for Jesus. They were all fallible, so they're not exemplary in every respect. Some people will say you should never, you should never even uh, try to apply a biblical text to ethical issues. Rather, you should let the Holy Spirit do that in the hearts of the hearers of Scripture. Uh, to, to apply it is to, in effect, do with it something we're not meant to do. Uh, but that is a complete misunderstanding as well. Scripture's entire purpose is application. Scripture's purpose is application. Uh, scripture is inspired and it is profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that we might be thoroughly and completely equipped for every good deed, every good work. So how is that going to happen? Well, the Scripture is applied to our lives in the process of living, and that changes us through time. Uh, so all of our preaching and all of our teaching is application by its very nature. If it isn't, then it isn't biblical teaching and biblical preaching. If all I do when I preach is give people information, that is not biblical preaching. Biblical preaching is taking the truth and seeing how God wants to apply it to the lives of His people, how He wants to change the lives of His people, and that is a very application-centered way of teaching and preaching. And so, uh, teaching and preaching is meant to answer the questions people commonly have about God and about Christ and about the purpose of redemption and salvation. And so the goal of the preacher is the same goal as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit ultimately applies the truth to the hearts of people. The pastor, the preacher, and the teacher is focused on applying the truth to the hearts of the people who receive it. And that's what the Holy Spirit is meant to do. So I am, in effect, cooperating with the Spirit in doing that as I teach the Bible to people. Uh, and <clears throat> some people would argue that 
in whatever you do in your preaching, let's say, you should always make a soteriology, that is the doctrine of salvation, and eschatology, that is the doctrine of the end time, the primary theme of your teaching, whatever the text. And there again, that I believe is a mistake. It is a mistake. Uh, it leads to some strange and arbitrary interpretations of the Bible. Uh, and if you do that, you will miss multiple themes in Scripture that are valuable and important for uh, Christian living, which is ethical living. And so we don't want to fall prey to that either. So you take a word like value or virtue. Value is uh, what we're going to say that means, in effect, is value is about the quality of worth or merit. Value is the quality of worth or merit. So we discover that there are lots of different kinds of value. You have economic value, you have aesthetic value, uh, ethical value is one of many values that we have. And so ethics is sometimes regarded as a subset of value theory, value theory. So if you go to university in America, I don't know about here, but if you go to university in America, uh, you'll rarely ever, if you major in philosophy, let's say, you'll never get a course on ethics. There is no such course as ethics. What you'll have is a course on value theory value theory because ethics is only possible once you've established values and once you have values you can then talk about those values as they relate to human experience or politics or science or whatever you want then you have a word like virtue virtue is the ground upon which praise is derived so virtue if someone is virtuous, that's worthy of praise. That's worthy of praise. To be virtuous is to be worthy of praise. Uh, there are non-moral and moral virtues. Non-moral virtues would be things like uh, a person who's efficient, a person who's skillful, a person who's talented. They have little or nothing to do with ethical, moral virtues. Those are virtues. Talent, skill, whatever. But they're not moral virtues. All right. Uh, moral virtue would be something like a morally good character. A morally good character. And so again, you'll read about, if you do much reading in this area, you'll read about what's called virtue ethics. Virtue ethics. And virtue ethics is really an attempt, in secular word terms, to recover the emphasis that was started with Aristotle and bring it up to the modern times of ethics. You see, what most ethics in um, contemporary terms does, what most ethicists do, is they approach what they would call riddles or quandaries, disputes. So ethics is all about solving a riddle. It's resolving a dispute. It doesn't matter whether you're a moral person or not. It just matters, can you solve the dispute, solve the riddle? Can you, can you make a quandary that is something apparently contradictory work and be coherent? And so in the last 30 years, a big emphasis in Western thinking and philosophy relative to ethics is to talk not so much about solving riddles, but rather about the person solving the riddle. And so the person being a, a virtuous mind. And that's a big emphasis in modern secular philosophy. I would argue that that's a, a healthy corrective, but clearly not a corrective sufficient to make it a Christian. Uh, then you have words like good, which is simply an adjective of com commendation. Uh, you can use that both in a moral sense and a non-moral sense. Uh, when you say he is a good plumber, you don't mean he's a good person plumber. You mean he's a good plumber. That is, he knows what to do when the pipe breaks or the water heating system breaks down. He's a good uh, plumber. Or this is a good computer. The Mac is a good computer. That's not a moral computer. It's not an ethical computer. It's just a good computer. It has what we would call 
teleological goodness. Now you need to be aware, these are words we're going to use over and over. And if you don't grasp the meaning of these words, like teleological, then you're going to miss a lot of what Scripture itself talks about, because Scripture talks a lot about teleology. And teleology is simply a, 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 a word, which is a combination of two words, and those words are telos and logos. Telos means end or purpose, pointed toward a goal. It's telos. Logos simply means words about the purpose, words about purpose. And so a teleological sense of good means it's good for some purpose. It's good for some end, some objective that we might have. So you could be a good teacher. I could be a good teacher, but be a very immoral person. Pulpits are full of people who are good communicators, good preachers, but are not moral people at all. So they have a teleological goodness, that is, the purpose of communication, they are good, but in terms of their character, it's a big problem, all right? So that's not teleological goodness, that's something else. So moral issues affect skills, uh, can affect skills. In other words, you could be a good plumber and have a drinking problem. If you're a good plumber with a drinking problem, that's a problem. Because if you're sober and doing the plumbing, that's good. But if you're drunk and doing the plumbing, you could be a good plumber and make a mess of the job because you're drinking. And so there, a good plumber can have moral issues that affect his ability or her ability to do uh, a job well. And that would be a non-moral good attached to a, a, a moral bad. So a drunk plumber is a good plumber in his skill, but a bad plumber in his character. Uh, so it's important to recognize all the analogies between moral and non-moral goodness. Moral and non-moral goodness. And the, the important thing to recognize is that God determines the ground of com commendation. God determines the ground of commendation. He uh, establishes the ground for achieving that moral goodness. He establishes the ground of moral goodness, the basis of achieving moral goodness. And so uh, they are teleological goods in that they are for the purpose of building the kingdom of God. If it's building the kingdom of God, it is a morally, teleologically good thing. It's a good action. And so skills are involved, capacities are involved, moral and non-moral skills are involved, but ultimately and fundamentally the moral dimension is the most important, the most important dimension. So moral goodness is a human act, and it's important to define these things, but moral goodness is a, a human act attitude or person receiving God's blessing. I'll repeat that. It's a human act, attitude, or person receiving God's blessing. Now notice what we just eliminated through that definition uh, uh, that would be uh, uh, not consistent. Notice what it said. I said a human act, attitude, or person receiving God's blessing. So it's not simply the act, right? I could do good things and be a morally bad person. So it isn't simply the act, but it includes the act. It also includes the attitude, the internal part of who I am, right? It includes my person as a totality, my complete person, not just my mind, not just any other part of me, but me in my totality. Doing, thinking, behaving in such a way that God blesses that activity. And that's ultimately what we mean here when we talk about biblical ethics. What receives the blessing of God versus what receives the curse of God? And ethics isn't simply reducible to actions, external things. It's not simply reducible to good intentions. People do bad things with good intentions all the time. There's a combination of intention, attitude, thinking, as well as the actual accomplishment of something.
And so it's a pretty heavy burden to talk about what is blessed by God in your life or my life. Then you have the wor a word like right. Right, sometimes right is used synonymous with good. So an act is a good act or a right act, and those are simply the same. Uh, if you say right, you're tending to talk in more legal ways about something. Good is more in terms of <clears throat> a, a kind of attitude. Right and good, they, they're about the same thing, but they're just emphasizing different pieces of it. Uh, and so you have a word like ought. You ought to do that. That is a verb of obligation. It indicates an action mandated by an ethical norm, something you ought to do. Not that you should do, that you might want to consider doing, but that you are obligated to do. Okay, an obligation and duty, something we ought to do. And you have different kinds of duties and obligations that we have. You have what I call prima facie duties. That is, simply on the surface, they're obviously duties. Uh, so, don't kill people. That's a prima facie obligation. Look around, don't kill people. All right. Uh, there, are, there are exceptions. We, some would argue there are exceptions, like in war, you can kill people, but on a normal, everyday way of living, you don't go around killing people, okay? So there's a prima facie duty of not to just simply kill people. Uh, then there's actual obligations, and those are actual obligations where you take all these various things into consideration before you make a decision. You have duties that you, do, you must perform at a given moment. Those are called present obligations. And then you have obligations that come later that eventually you'll get around to doing. And so they're mandatory, but they're not mandatory in an immediate sense of the word. And you have things like justice. What is justice? Well, it's simply stated moral rightness, fairness, equality. And so <clears throat> depending on your views, if you're someone who is a conservative, uh, you'll talk about equality of opportunity. Okay, You can't guarantee equality of result, but you can guarantee as much as humanly possible equality of opportunity. And if you're of a different persuasion, you can go even farther and say not only a quality of opportunity, but a quality of condition that makes your ability to act on the opportunity possible. And that's a totally, you know, a much larger sense of what it would be if you would, might say was uh, uh, equality. And then you have ethical justification. What is ethical justification? Ethical justification is simply reasoning in an attempt to show what the right action is. Reasoning, attempting to show what the right action is. Or what right action should be taken. And that has both a subjective and an objective dimension. A subjective dimension is about the reasons we have for justifying actions. I possess a reason. That's the subjective part of it. The objective is it's a reason that is grounded externally from myself. It isn't just that I feel strongly about it being the right thing to do, but that it's stated to be the right thing to do, and that means it's stated by God as the right thing to do. So my feeling and the objective are meant to be seen as united. Okay, If it's only about my feeling, but not connected to anything objective, then it's simply more than my, it's just my opinion, however strongly I might hold that opinion, that leads me to do something or not do something. And so you have then levels of justification, levels of justification. So you have obligation, you have duty, you have obedience to a command. These are things you must do, ought to do, and should do. And that is both on an individual level and on a corporate level. And that leads to then a prohibition, which would be a negative obligation. For every positive obligation, there is a negative obligation. If I'm supposed to do this, to love my neighbor as I love myself, that means I'm not supposed to use my neighbor for my own purposes, for my own pleasure, for my own benefit. So a positive always seems to imply a negative when it comes to uh, obligations.
And then you have a word like permission, to give permission to do something. And that uh, approved by a biblical example that, uh, that the things are not commanded. When uh, uh, you know, David's men are hungry, there's no command to give them the table bread. No command. It's sort of like you're permitted to do this. To deny it, would then bring to bear a whole set of rules that simply don't exist. And so he permits them to eat this food. He doesn't command that they be given the food. He permits them to get the food. So that's a biblical example of a permission, not a command. Uh, and so it's an express commission. Eating meat is an express permission. You don't have to eat meat, but he told Peter, you can eat these things. You don't have to, but you can't deny others the right to because of some biblical truth or some rule. You can't do that. And then sometimes there's biblical silence. There's simply nothing in the Bible about that. Uh, that there's no categorization in the Bible of a particular act being sinful. So who am I to impose something the Scriptures are silent about on someone else as if the, the Scriptures weren't silent about it, but they were speaking very clearly about it. Of course, they're not. And so then you have commendation, you have praise. Uh, scripture doesn't seem to command them for every person, uh, but nobody should be charged with sin for failure to perform, for so example, acts of moral heroism. So I can't tell you tonight that if you're walking home and you see someone uh, robbing an elderly woman that you must intervene and you must protect the elderly woman and you must try to capture the robber. I can't, I can't, I can't tell you you have to do that. I can't. The Scriptures just don't give me the right to say that. Moral heroism is not commanded in Scripture. There are certain things that might lead to such actions on the part of some. For example, one's physical ability to actually successfully accomplish the objective. If I am in a wheelchair and see an elderly woman being robbed, what am I supposed to do? I can't do anything except feel guilty for not doing anything. So therefore, I have no basis to make you feel obligated to do anything. You may or you may not, based on all sorts of circumstances and considerations that I may have no idea what they are. Uh, the the uh, one time when I was in Africa, we were driving along. There are not a lot of street lights <laughs> in most of Africa, uh, and so you're driving. And, but there's uh, people are always walking or riding bicycles in the dark and there's no law that requires that bicycles have lights and there's no requirement that bicyclists have reflective gear on so that if your headlight hits somebody you'll go Oop, person don't hit them or anything like that so it's dark and people are walking literally on the road where the car is supposed to go because it's muddy there's no shoulders on the road there are people on bicycles with no reflectors and you're driving along and all of a sudden you hear this thump and you've run over somebody and you didn't even know you did it and so that happened to me on one occasion I didn't run over them but I knocked them off their bicycle and uh, I had four children in my car with me uh, two of whom were not mine. And it was dark, and it was uh, risky business. And so I'm sitting there thinking, what would be the right thing to do? And of course, my instinct was to stop the car, get out, go see this person, and see if he needed assistance. Maybe the bike just fell over and he wasn't hurt, whatever the situation might be. And so I got out of the car, dark, uh, I see this guy laying on the ground with his bicycle, uh, and he, his bicycle is obviously damaged, and he is apparently in some distress. I wasn't sure how much distress, because it was dark. And so I picked him up and put him in my car, along with his bicycle, and drove him to a hospital. Good Samaritan, right? <laughs> Good old Michael. Anyway, uh, so I drove to the hospital. And <clears throat> when we got to the hospital, uh, you had to go through these big gates, these that come up and down or whatever, and you get inside. And once you're inside, you can't get out unless somebody lifts the gate. 
Now you think, so what? Well, you're a prisoner on the grounds of the hospital. You can't get out unless somebody lets you out. Once I got inside, I took the fellow into the emergency room, and then all of a sudden he appeared to be much better. And I'm thinking, well, he's not really hurt at all. There was, light, there was some light in there, and I could see, and he wasn't hurt. But about a hundred of his Somali friends were likewise in the emergency room. A hundred Somali friends. And they demanded that I pay money for his uh, medical expenses. And how much money? Well, more than I had. And then they threatened me that they weren't going to let me out of the parking lot unless I paid the money. And then they proceeded to uh, attack me because they figured I must have money, I'm just lying. And so here I am doing a good thing, right? And I'm finding myself in a position of being attacked for doing a good thing for a person who basically was running a scam against motorists. This was apparently a routine scam run by people to get people like me to stop, pick them up, take them to the hospital, and then make them pay a ransom to get out of the hospital. Me, pay the ransom to get out of the hospital. So I went to a friend of mine after this whole thing finally settled down hours later. I went to a friend of mine who'd lived there for 25 years. In fact, his two children were with me and my two children. And he said, well, I'm glad you got out of that circumstance, you know. He said, but you know, you need to really think about your moral priorities. And I was thinking like, oh, okay. He said, you know, there are ethical priorities. Your number one priority was making sure these children got home safely. Then, if you want to go back and see what you can do, go for it. But you put my children at risk, your children at risk, by doing what you thought was a morally heroic thing to do. I wasn't commanded to do it. I felt obligated to do it. And it turned out that it was the devil motivating more than anything else for me to act this way. Because I seem, I probably was hoping for praise, appreciation for taking this guy to the well, hospital. Normally, that would be the right thing to do. Normally, it would, except context is everything. Mm -hmm. Context is everything. Context is everything. Africa, dark, refugees, thousands of refugees. And they're not good people necessarily. They're sinners, just like everybody else, taking advantage of people. And so you have to keep context constantly in your mind when you think about doing one thing or not. But I'm not going to make you feel guilty because you did not stop, that you took those children home. And when you got back, he was gone. Of course he was gone. He was waiting on another person in a car. You were just one of many he was trying to trap that night to get you to take him to the hospital so he could exploit you. Okay, so the ultimate standard of obligation is the self-giving love of Christ. The self-giving love of Christ. That's the ultimate, if you will, standard of obligation. The self-giving love of Christ. But we know Jesus said very clearly he, never, he did not entrust Himself to men. Why? Do you remember? He did not entrust Himself to men. Why? Because He knew men's hearts. Oh, that's helpful to remember. Even Jesus didn't allow Himself to be taken advantage of because He knew men's hearts. He knew that their hearts were evil. Oh, well, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> people feel obligations and that's, that's part of God's work in our lives for us to feel certain obligations. But we always have to measure obligation against command. Okay, is there a command for this? Uh, you know, am I able to do this without putting other people at risk? Uh, in other words, I might feel really good about it, but I put all these other people at risk, which could be ultimately very devastating if something really bad were to happen. So you see how complex it can become, uh, this idea of being ethical and moral. So, <clears throat> so what are then the characteristics of ethical debate 
uh, today. Contemporary characteristics of ethical debate today. And why don't we take a, a break at seven o'clock? We'll take a break and then we'll come back. Okay? Sure. So quick, uh, how can you avoid confusing the um, context versus situational ethics? You know, not succumbing to changing your ethic because of a situation mm -hmm. versus right. context. Because I understand yeah. context. Yeah. How do you? Well, the situational the situational approach assumes there is no good. There is no one good except love. That's the whole philosophy of situation ethics. Mm -hmm. So, and then love is not defined. It's a very subjective thing. Uh, there is no. Uh, what did Jesus say when he said, "If you love me, you do what? Do what I command." Yeah. Keep my commandments. So love is not incompatible with obedience to command. All right, but situational ethics says there is only one command, and that is love, which is an abstraction. In other words, it can mean anything you want it to mean. So the fundamental difference is how am I meant to obey this command given the situation in which I find myself? And that's a complex thing. You have to, but there's never any question that there's a command I'm meant to obey. It's just a question: how am I supposed to obey? that command. It's much harder than situation. Situation is easy because you just go, I'll do the loving thing. What's the loving thing? Well, if you have to hurt a few people to do the loving thing, yeah, hurt a few people to do the loving thing. Well, that's not what Jesus is about at all. So it's this. It's not forgetting the command. It's how am I best meant to apply that command given the situation in which I find myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Coffee.